Since complex numbers are so important to quantum mechanics, let's do a few more examples. In this case, I'm going to demonstrate how to manipulate complex numbers in a more general way, not so much just doing examples with numbers. First example, simplify this expression. You have two complex numbers multiplied in the numerator, and then a division. First of all, the first thing to simplify is this multiplication. You have x plus iy times ic. This is pretty easy. It's a simple sort of distribution. We're going to have x times ic. That's going to be a complex part. So I'm going to write that down a little bit to the right. i, x, c. And then we're going to have iy times ic, which is going to be minus yc. That's going to be real. We also have a real part in the numerator from the d here. So I'm going to write this as d minus yc plus ic. That's the uh, result of multiplying this out. That's then going to be divided by f plus ig. Now in order to simplify this, we have a complex number in the denominator. You know you need to multiply by the complex conjugate and divide by the complex conjugate. So f minus ig divided by f minus ig. Now expanding this out is a little bit messier, but fundamentally you've seen this sort of thing before. You have real part, real part, and imaginary part, imaginary part in the numerator, and then you're going to have imaginary part, real part, and real part, imaginary part. And what you're going to end up with from this first term, you get f times d minus yc. From the second term, you have minus ig times ixc, which is going to give you xcg. We have a minus i times an i, which is going to give us a plus. Incidentally, if you're having trouble figuring out something like minus i times i, think about it in the geometric interpretation. This is i in the complex plane. This is minus i in the complex plane. So I have one angle going up, one angle going down. If I'm multiplying them together, I'm adding the angles together. So I essentially go up and back down, and I just end up with 1 equals i times minus i. Otherwise, you can keep track of i squared equals minus 1s and just count up your minus signs. This, then, is the real part. I suppose I should write that in green, lest my fonts get too confusing. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the real part. The imaginary part, then, is what you get from these terms here. I'm going to write an i out front, and now we have xc times f, so xcf with an i from here, and then we have d minus yc times ig, which I'll just write as g d minus yc. In the denominator, we're now multiplying a number by its complex conjugate, you know what to do there, f squared plus g squared. This is just the magnitude of this complex number. Sorry, squared magnitude. Now, this doesn't necessarily look more simple than what we started with, but this is effectively fully simplified. You could further distribute this and distribute this, but it's not really going to help you very much. The thing to notice about this is that the denominator is purely real. We've also separated out the real part of the numerator and the imaginary part of the numerator. Yeesh. My handwriting is getting messier as I go. Imaginary part of the numerator. So we can look at this numerator now and say, ah, this is the complex number, real part, imaginary part, and then it's just divided by this real number, which effectively is just a scaling. It's, it's a relatively simple thing to do to divide by a real number. As a second example, Consider solving this equation for x. Now this is the same expression that we had in the last problem, only now we're solving it for it equal to zero. So from the last page, I'm going to borrow that first simplification step we did distributing this through. We had d minus yc for the real part plus ixc for the imaginary part, and that was divided by f plus i g. If we're setting this equal to zero, 
The nice part about dealing with complex expressions like this is that 0 treated as a complex number is 0 plus 0i. It has a real part and an imaginary part as well, it's just kind of trivial. And in order for this complex number to be equal to 0, the real part must be 0 and the imaginary part must be 0. So we can think of this as d minus yc plus ixc. This has to equal 0 and this has to equal 0 separately. So we effectively have two equations here, not just one, which is nice. We have d minus yc equals 0 and xc equals 0, which unless c equals 0 just means x equals 0. That's the only way that this equation can hold, is if x equals 0. The key fact here is to keep in mind that the, in order for two complex numbers to be equal, both the real parts and the imaginary parts have to be equal. As a slightly more involved example, consider finding the, the cubed roots of 1. Now you know 1 cubed is 1, that's a good place to start. We'll see that fall out of the algebra pretty quickly. What we're trying to do is solve the equation z cubed equals 1, which you can think of as x plus i y, where x and y are real numbers, cubed equals 1. Now if we expand out this cubic, you get x cubed plus 3x squared times i y plus 3x times i y squared plus i y cubed. And this is going to have to equal 1, <clears throat> excuse me, equal 1. Now, looking at these expressions, here we have an i y, here we have an i y squared. This is going to give me an i squared, which is going to be a minus sign. And here I have an i y cubed. This is going to give me an i cubed, which is going to be minus i. So I have two complex parts and two real parts. So I'm going to rewrite that. x cubed, and then now a minus sign from the i squared, 3xy squared, plus pulling an i out front. The imaginary part then is going to come from this 3x squared y and this y cubed. So I've got a 3x squared y here, and then a minus y cubed, minus coming from the i squared. And this is also going to have to equal 1. Now in order for this complex number to equal this complex number, both the real parts and the imaginary parts have to be equal. So let's write those two separate equations. x cubed minus 3xy squared equals the real part, of, this is the real part of the left hand side, has to equal the real part of the right hand side, 1, and the imaginary part of the left hand side, 3 x squared y minus y cubed has to equal the imaginary part of the right hand side, 0. So those are our two equations. This one in particular is pretty easy to work with. Um, we can simplify this. This is, you know, we can factor a y out. This is y times 3x squared minus y squared equals 0. One possible solution then is going to come from this. You know, you have a product like this is equal to 0, either this is equal to 0, or this is equal to 0. And saying y equals to 0 is rather straightforward. So let's say y equals 0, and let's substitute that into this expression. That's going to give us x cubed equals 1, which might look a lot like the equation we started with, z cubed equals 1, but it's subtly different because z is a general complex number, whereas our assumption in starting the problem this way is that x is a purely real number. So a purely real number, which when cubed gives you 1, that means x equals 1. So x equals 1, y equals 0, that's one of our solutions, z equals 1 plus 0i, or just z, z equals 1. Now we could have told me that right off the bat, z, z cubed equals 1, 1, well, z, one possible solution is that z equals 1, since 1 cubed is 1. The other thing we can do here is we can say 3x squared minus y squared is equal to 0. This means that 
I'll just cheat a little bit and simplify this. 3x squared equals y squared. Now I can substitute this in, this y squared, into this expression as well. And what you end up with is x cubed minus 3x and then y squared was equal to 3x squared. So 3x squared is going to go in there. That has to equal 1. Now let's move up here. What does that leave us with? That says x cubed minus 9x cubed equals 1. So minus 8x cubed equals 1. This means x, again being a purely real number, is equal to minus 1 half. Minus 1 half times minus 1 half times minus 1 half times 8 times minus 1 is equal to 1. You can check that pretty easily. Now, where does that leave us? Where did I go? That leaves us substituting this back in to this expression, which tells us that 3x squared equals y squared, x equals minus 1 half, so 3 minus 1 half squared equals y squared, which tells you that y equals plus or minus the square root of 3 fourths, if you finish your solution. So now we have two solutions for y here coming from one value for x, and that gives us our other two solutions to this cubic. We have a cubic equation, we would expect there to be three solutions, especially when we're working with complex numbers like this. And this is our other solution. z equals minus one half plus or minus the square root of three fourths i. So those are our three solutions. Now, finding the cubed roots of one to be these complex numbers is not necessarily particularly instructive. However, there's a nice geometric interpretation. The cubed roots of unity like this, the nth roots of unity, doesn't have to be a cubed root. All lie on a circle of radius 1 in the complex plane. And if you check the complex magnitude of this number, and the complex magnitude of this number, you will find that it is indeed unity. To check your understanding of this, a slightly simpler problem is to find the square roots of i. Um, put another way, you've got z, some generic complex number here, equals to x squared plus x plus i y. Quantity squared, if that's going to equal y, will expand this out, solve for x and y in the two equations that will result from setting real and imaginary parts equal to each other. And same as with the cubed roots of 1, the square roots of i will also fall on a circle of radius 1 in the complex plane. So those are a few examples of how complex numbers can actually be manipulated. Uh, in particular, finding the roots of unity, there are better formulas for that than the approach that we took here, but I feel this was hopefully instructive.